All right, well, good morning, Community Chapel Fest, and wherever you may be. Again, we're excited and thankful that even through a difficult season like we're in, we have the opportunities and the resources to uh, have our service like this and record it and uh, worship with our church family. So we are excited about that. Uh, we do miss all of you. It is very weird having a service with not many, very many people here. So uh, it is weird, but we miss you. But we again, we're excited and thankful that we're able to do this together for this service. I want to start out by saying uh, welcome to anyone who maybe is joining us for the first time. I know last week we had a lot of people from our church share the link for our, this service through Facebook or other ways. Um, and so if you're joining us for the first time, I want to send a special welcome to you and uh, invite you to check out our website at some point uh, today just to learn a little bit about us. And if you're from the area, and you would like to check us out in person sometime, whenever that would be possible, we would love to have you with us. But as far as church announcements go, again, we're just sort of going through this one or two weeks at a time to see what happens. But as we're doing that, we are still planning for some upcoming events and activities that we have on the church calendar. So as we are doing that, if you could help us out, that would be great. And I know you can't go to the lobby and sign up for different events, but you can check out our website where you can sign up for different things and find all the information that you need. So please be sure to check that out. And if you have any questions, you can give us a call here at the church office. Specifically, I did want to mention that we've decided to go ahead and postpone the Art of Marriage seminar that was scheduled for this coming weekend. So we will plan on rescheduling that at a later time and let you know when we choose to do that. As of right now, we're still waiting on what to do about the events in the month of April. So that would be the men's chili cook-off and cornhole tournament, the ladies' packing party, as well as our Easter services. So we will let you know as soon as we can about those, uh, what the game plan is for those upcoming events. And so again, if you have any questions about any announcements or upcoming events or how to access things online, please be sure to contact the church office anytime this week, and we would love to help you out. Um, I want to share a verse with you. Psalm 118.24, a very familiar verse, says, This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And if you're like me, it hasn't been very easy to rejoice in some of the things that have happened over the past couple weeks, but we should rejoice because the Lord has given us another day here on this earth to serve Him and to worship Him. And so we're going to do that together this morning. But before I turn the service over, let us bow for a word of prayer. Father, again, we just thank you for giving us as a church the resources and the abilities to record the service for this morning so that we can worship together as a church family. And Father, I pray as we go through our service today that wherever it is that we may be, that you would help us stay focused on worshiping you today. Uh, we have so much to be thankful for, uh, so much to worship you about, and I pray that that is the reason that we're here this morning, not because it's uh, Sunday morning and it's time for church. That's not why we're watching this service, but it's because we want to worship you. We have so many things to be thankful for, so many things to worship you about, and Lord, not just on Sundays, but each and every day. Uh, I pray that that is our focus, that our lives are are all about you. And so I pray that uh, you would be with us as we go through this service, and I ask that everything that is said and done will be for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Good morning. So, great way to uh, praise God is to sing some praises to Him. So, we're going to start out this morning with. There is a Redeemer. The words will be on your screen. There is a Redeemer, Jesus God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah. Oh, 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 o
precious Lamb of God, Messiah, oh, for sin is slain. Thank you. Grace to come up and join Isaac for special music. Oh 
Good morning, church family. Well, thank you, Grace and Faith and Isaac, uh, for that song this morning. Uh, at this time, um, if you can turn to your Bibles and go to Psalm 46. I'll give you a moment to get your Bibles out and turn to Psalm 46. But first, before I, I read that, I was just so excited to, to learn about last week's service, and there was over 450 hits on uh, the service. So I just thank you guys for uh, showing up and, and viewing uh, the sermon, and um, I, I pray that it'll be the same this week as well. But for right now, let's go to Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. All right, at this time will be our, our tithes and offerings. And again, um, obviously, you guys are not uh, right here. Uh, and the ushers cannot come right down here and, and take our tithes and offerings, but uh, there are options available. And on the right corner of uh, the screen, if you're on our website, uh, you'll see online giving. That's one option. Um, you can always do regular mail, uh, mail it into the church here. Or if you even want to drive by, drop it off um, uh, at the church here, that will work as well. But so at this point, we are going to pray for our tithes and offerings and, and worship God. Our Father, thank you so much for your goodness. Lord, thank you for how you have blessed us in so many ways. Lord, when we think of really this past week and everything that has happened, um, even the last two weeks, Lord, uh, every day seems to be something new and a, a, a big change in the way we live our lives. Lord, but we know you are in control. Lord, we can trust in you, and we thank you for that. Lord, at this time, we do want to worship you with our tithes and offerings. And Lord, I, I thank you for the, just the, um, the way you have blessed us as a church family, blessed us as a, a community and, and individual families, Lord, in, in so many ways. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for, and we praise you for that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We'll continue in worshiping with our voices. So we're going to uh, 
go to a nice traditional hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and, and certainly God is so faithful and we have everything to praise Him for. Pastor Scott. I know you're not all here with us this morning, but, and everyone said, amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together in your name. We thank you for the privilege that we have to sing songs of praise to your name, and Lord, to reflect back over uh, Lord, not just the, the recent weeks, but throughout the course of our lives and, and to be in remembrance of your faithfulness to us. And as we are entering into this Easter season, the cross constantly stands as a reminder of the faithfulness of the God of all the universe. And, and we're so grateful that when Adam and Eve, uh, they, they, they sinned in that garden, that that wasn't the end. I'm so thankful you didn't just wring your hands or wash your hands of us and, and just move away, but instead you move closer. And you already knew in eternity past that the plan would be for Jesus Christ, the sinless, sovereign Son of God, to be the Lamb that would be slain for the forgiveness of our sins. 
the lamb whose blood would be shed to satisfy the wrath of God, the, the lamb who would die on that tree, becoming our sin that we could receive the righteousness of God in his place. And we are so grateful for your faithfulness to us. And Lord, the, the one who was willing to go so far as to give his own life when we were sinners, when we were the enemies of the cross, how much more as your children can we trust you and depend upon you for that measure of faithfulness? Thank you so much. Lord, as, as we go through the, this, this current trial, this, this pandemic, this coronavirus, COVID-19, what it's being called, Lord, we realize that there is nothing new under the sun. We, we realize that nothing is too hard for you. It takes, and Lord, gives us great confidence to know that you're not sitting on your throne, uh, wringing your hands and, and wondering what's going to happen here. But on the contrary, you are sovereignly in control of absolutely everything that's going on around us. And as was shared earlier in the, in the service here today, while it, it may not be uh, our desire to have to meet together in this way, using the internet for our services, Lord, even in the midst of this, I am thankful that that, that number of people, over 450 uh, views or shares of this, of this last week's service, um, hitting homes and, and families that may not have been in church on that Sunday and definitely may not have been here at Heston. And so, Lord, even in the midst of this time, you are using this for good. Lord, I thank you for those in our community that, that, that frankly, are, are slightly scared. They're intimidated by what's going on, and it's caused them to ask questions. And, Lord, I pray that we would, as much as we're able to be in contact with people, but definitely using the technology we've been blessed to have. Oh, Lord, it's so tempting to, to, to be critical. It's so, so tempting to question motives and, 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 to, and to look at this situation uh, through a critical eye and spirit. But Lord, I pray that as your people, we would use this as a wonderful opportunity, as a platform in the midst of a situation maybe we don't want to be in. And we absolutely have zero control over at this point to be your hands and feet to be your mouthpieces. Lord, for those that are looking for answers, to be able to point them to the word of God, to the hope, uh, to, to the rock, potential rock of their salvation if they were to turn to Christ. And, and so, Lord, we, we pray that you would continue to use this for our good and for your glory and help us to see ways as, as your people, as your hands and feet, that we can do that. Uh, Lord, I do pray for those in our congregations that, and in our homes for those that are viewing that, that may be more apt to be in jeopardy because of this, that, that Lord, you would minister to them, that you would comfort them. Uh, it's easy in times like this to be overwhelmed with anxiety, uh, discouragement, and fear and worry. And, and Lord, rather than experience those things, that they might look to you, the God of peace, to experience the peace that passes all understanding. And Lord, help us to be mindful, to be checking up on each other, and to meet needs as they arise, as we're able to, and, and Lord, we thank you in advance uh, for the ways we can do that. Uh, Lord, we do pray for our missionaries that are serving around the world. And I am certain that this has um, hindered them in their traditional methods. And I pray that you would help them, Lord, to continue to be able to spread the gospel, even though their face-to-face -face interactions may have changed. I think of one of our missionaries, uh, Lord Tim Clayball. We ask that you would minister to him and grant him safety and, and, and just, uh, Lord, and, and peace of mind as he makes his way home. And we, we pray for his family, Lord, that you would encourage them as they await his arrival. And, and just ask, Lord, that you would bless him as he looks to get back to the States here. And, and Lord, as we continue through our service today, um, I pray that you would continue, continually remind us who it is that really is holding us. As your people, if we really believe that you are sovereign, if we genuinely believe that you're in charge, that you're in control, that nothing in these lives happens that doesn't sift through your sovereign hands first, then we have to know that we can trust you as our God. Trust you that, Lord, not only is there, is there a light at the end of this, there is a light through this. And to trust that, Lord, not only will you use this for your glory, but, Lord, even in some ways, and we may not see it at this point, you're going to use it for our good as individuals, as churches, as communities. So, Father, help us to trust you and help us to trust that you are holding us fast through this season of uncertainty, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
At this time, we are going to sing together, He Will Hold Me Fast. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He must hold. This time we have another special number before we go to the Word.
Pastor Doug shared a little bit ago is absolutely strange to not see each of you in the house of the Lord with us as we're sharing the word of God together, singing songs of praise to his name together. But I'm so grateful that you've joined us this morning uh, from the comfort of your home or wherever it is that you may be at this time. The message titled today is Keys to Handling Situations Out of Our Control. And, and something over the course of the past 40 years that I can say even in regards to my own self is that in this flesh we can be so quick, I can be so quick 
to respond in ways that maybe are anything but not only pleasing to the Lord, but productive in light of the situation that we're in the midst of. And adversity, regardless of its form, can very much and often does very much shake and disrupt our attention from where it needs to be focused. Over the course of the past few weeks, even prior to some of the decisions as a church, we were prayerfully, I want to say forced, but in, in prayer had to make. There were other things that were going on. In fact, there are those that through the course of ministry over the past couple of weeks have been battling through the brokenness in their lives, broken promises, lost jobs, lost loved ones, dreams that had been looked forward to that were shattered, broken marriages and broken homes. And all of those things have absolutely little to do, nothing to do, with the current pandemic that we find ourselves in the midst of. But regardless of the storm, regardless of the heartbreak, the trial, or the setback, when, when the storms of this life rain down and the waves seem to constantly pound upon us, and, and they will, and seemingly from every direction, we as God's people need to constantly remind ourselves of who our source of hope, peace, Comfort, strength, and provision is. We as God's people need to turn to the Lord. And we as God's people need to turn to the word of God. And I want to invite you to do just that this morning. If you would turn with me back to the Old Testament, um, near the beginning of the Old Testament, the book of Second Chronicles, looking at chapter 20. And we're going to look at King Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, and his response when, when, when he was handling a situation that was out of his control. And from the text this morning, we're going to see seven keys, not necessarily seven steps, but seven keys that, that we can apply in our own lives as, as we encounter situations out of our control. And as we look in verses 1 through 2, the first two verses of Second Chronicles 20, we see the situation that the king of Judah and his people find themselves in. It says in, in, in verse 1, It came to pass after this also, that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, and with them other beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat the battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There comes a great multitude against you from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi, in Jedi. And one of the things that we see right off the bat, and it says, And it came to pass after this also. At the very beginning of verse 1 in chapter 20, we see that this, this news came to Jehoshaphat after something else had just transpired. And we'll talk about this in a little more depth in just a little bit. But King Jehoshaphat and his people had just encountered and came through and weathered another trial not long before. And upon the heels of receiving some counsel from a godly man, bad news comes to the king once more. And the bad news is that there are three nations that have joined together against Judah, against King Jehoshaphat. They are 25 miles to the southeast of Judah and they're coming with, with harm, with death, with, with pain in mind for God's people. And so when death and defeat seemed imminent for King Jehoshaphat, when he encountered a situation that absolutely was out of his control, what was the first thing that he did? We turn to verses 3 through 4, and, and this is what we read. He's just received the bad news. These three nations are coming. And Jehoshaphat feared. In the days in which we live, there are so many who have said over the course of the past week and a half, two weeks, of how afraid they are. You know, not knowing how things are going to turn out. And, and genuinely, you know, someone said, if, if we didn't have the Lord, what would we do in reference to hope right now? And the same could be said for King Jehoshaphat, as his life and the lives of his people were at stake. And it's not wrong to, to fear the, the unknown as far as the fact that it's coming. 
The question is, how will we respond in the face of that fear? And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. The very first thing that Jehoshaphat wisely did when this situation out of his control hit him was immediately to seek the Lord God. And, and you know, from a military standpoint, this probably seemed like a very foolish decision. I mean, in fact, it would have been ludicrous, it would have been ridiculous in Jehoshaphat's day to, to apparently do nothing. I mean, in, in, in Jehoshaphat's day, it was very common to form an allegiance militarily with another nation close by. And, and maybe you gave them some gold or silver out of the reserves to, to join you in fighting this common enemy. But he didn't form a military allegiance. And you know, maybe it would be like, if we're going to go down, we're not going down without a fight. So maybe it would have been to man the battle stations, but he didn't stage for battle. Or maybe a king caring for his people it would have been better than just run in the opposite direction. But he didn't call for retreat. So what did he do? In verse 3, he set himself to seek the Lord. In the midst of uncertainty, adversity, in the midst of the unknown in our lives, what's our response? Maybe it's a pity party. Uh, why does this have to happen to me? I mean, I didn't ask for this. Why do I have to do this? I'm not the one that's responsible. Why do I have to go through this right now? And it's not bad enough that we're having a pity party, but then we'll surround ourselves with people who will affirm us, even when we're wrong, to keep the party going. Or maybe it's in the face of adversity, of conflict, of brokenness, we play the blame game. Or maybe we bury our heads in the sand and we pretend that it's not happening. Or maybe in the midst of it, we turn to outlets that we know that are sinful and wrong. We know they're ineffective, but we do it anyway. Or maybe because sometimes, at least in our own estimation, it's easier to run away than to face the trial at hand, we run. And yet King Jehoshaphat has shown us the right way to run, and it's to run to the God of our salvation. One of the things that if you were to go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 18, I would encourage you maybe throughout the course of today, if not today, sometime this week, to get some background on this, this story here. But you'll find this isn't Jehoshaphat's first battle. In fact, if you were to go back to chapter 18, you would see there was another enemy that was going to be faced. And rather than run to God, Jehoshaphat and King Ahab, as you will see, did things in their own counsel according to their own wisdom. And it ended in death for King Ahab and almost death for Jehoshaphat. And one of the things that we see here from the king's response, it is never too late to stop and do the right thing. And, and what's special about Jehoshaphat the king, he's the leader, he's the one that everyone's looking to in a time of crisis looking to him for hope. He gives them the, the focal point of their hope, and it's the Lord God. And, and as Jehoshaphat went to seek the Lord, then you're going to see in a little bit that he, he declared a fast. And this isn't just like, I'm going to say a prayer and declaring a fast. It's like, we mean business. We know in the midst of our insufficiency, you're the only source of our hope. You're the only source of our help. And the king set his eyes and his, hearts on the, and his heart on the Lord God. And in verse 4, we see the importance of that. Because as the king of Judah immediately sought the Lord, it says, And Judah gathered themselves together to seek the Lord as well. You know, in the midst of this time, and I've shared these quotes before, but 
But Pastor Adrian Rogers says that we are living in gloriously dark days. And he went on to say that the darker the night, the brighter the light. You know, whether it's through your interactions personally or whether it's through social media, you and I have a wonderful opportunity to help set the world's eyes and hearts and affections on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the question is, what are we doing with the opportunity that God has given? Because Heston Chapel and those watching today the world around is watching and takes notice to what God's people are doing. In Acts chapter 16, verse 25, a, another special, a very special example that, that in the midst of a, a situation out of your control, if you were to go to Acts 16, you'd see that Paul and Silas were arrested and thrown in jail for doing absolutely nothing wrong. And in the innermost part of the, of, the, of the facility, after having been beaten, bloody, ripped and torn, as they're hanging and stretched out by chains, it says in verse 25 of Acts 16, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. And, and if you were to put it in modern terms, they, they weren't going and, and they weren't being critical of the ones who brought them there. And, and they weren't second guessing the leadership of the facility. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And, 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 and people, listen to what happened. And the prisoners heard them. You read on in that text, when, when the walls came tumbling down, not one of those prisoners had ran away despite the opportunity for apparent freedom. They had seen the faithfulness of God's people and why in the world wouldn't you want to stick around to see what was going to happen next? Because those people and Paul and Silas understood what Jehoshaphat did as well. As we look at step two, after immediately seeking the Lord, focusing his own attention and the attention of God's people back onto God. Secondly, we see in verses five through six that Jehoshaphat acknowledged God's sovereignty over this in all situations. And God's word says this, and Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest thou not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in your hand is there not power and might so that none is with able to withstand thee? I appreciate what the king says. He says, are you not the God in heaven? Are you not the one sovereign over all the created order, seen and unseen? It is not all power and might in your hands. It was Jehoshaphat went to the Lord in prayer and as God's people were in prayer with him, as he shared these words, as he cried out these words to God, Heston, I want you to understand, he didn't have to remind God of who he was. Jehoshaphat wisely reminded himself and the heart of his people who their faithful God was. And when you and I seek the Lord and we go to him in prayer, we are reminding ourselves of God's power and might and that builds our courage as we submit our trials and our tribulations into the hands of the one who holds all authority, including that trial. And when we look to the one who holds all authority, understanding that nothing has come across our plates in these last two weeks and really at any point of time in our lives that didn't sift through his hands first, and knowing that he sovereignly holds all authority, we submit our trials and tribulations into those hands, knowing that God is going to use it for his glory. And in some way, we will see that he will use it even for our own good as he navigates us through this current trial. And so he immediately sought the Lord. Secondly, he acknowledged, acknowledged God's sovereignty over this situation. And thirdly, verses 7 through 8, we see that he seeks God's assistance because these people were God's people and he was their God. In verses seven through eight, listen to the word of the Lord. Art not thou our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the seed of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwelt therein and have built you a sanctuary then for your name. And one of the things we see is that Jehoshaphat says, listen, God, as much as I'm their king, they're your people. And this land that they're coming to take, it's your land. 
You know, one of the things that my wife said to me in jest recently is we acquired a Ford Edge. And she laughed as she said, do not expect your father-in-law, my dad, to work on that. He hates Fords. And what I know about my, my father-in-law, he may be a John Deere mechanic, but he's a Mopar or Jeep man. He's an anything but a Ford man. And so I can't take that Ford to my father-in-law. Well, the truth is, in, in a very real sense, if that Ford Edge breaks, I will not take it to a Chevy garage. If your Chevy Silverado breaks, you will not take it to a Kia dealer. If, if you need a heart surgery, unless you don't want it done properly, you will not go to a foot doctor. And so why is God's people... Will we first go to anyone else but our maker for the concerns of our hearts and our lives? In Psalm 48, 14, after having recognized the sovereignty and the power and the faithfulness of God throughout Israel's history, the psalmist says in verse 14, for this God is our God forever and ever. And if you wonder how long forever and ever is, that's forever. It never stops. This God is our God forever and he will be our guide even unto death. And if you read in Psalm 73, it doesn't stop at death. It says that afterwards he'll receive us on the glory. The truth is from the moment you've trusted him to the moment he accepts you in the glory, every step in between on this earth, you are in his sovereign hands. And so as his people in his hands, as the trials and the adversity of this life out of your control hit, Solomon gives us a little more counsel in reference to seeking God's assistance as his people. In Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 7, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. In verse 7, Solomon says, be not wise in your own eyes. And, 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 you know, I think it's important when you study the word that you understand who the author is that you're reading from. Solomon, who was blessed by God richly with, with wisdom and with wealth and with prosperity and with peace throughout his reign, made a lot of mistakes as he looked to his own understanding, looked to do God's work his own way for his own benefit. In the end, he realized the vanity of it all. And having children that he didn't desire seeing make the same mistakes he did, he wrote these Proverbs to them. And in verse 7, he says, Be not wise in your own eyes. Listen, as much as Solomon could have given amen to his own scripture, so could King Jehoshaphat as he had almost died when he trusted in his own counsel at one point. The word goes on to say, Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And so we seek the Lord, we acknowledge his sovereignty, we seek God's assistance. And then number four, it's important as Jehoshaphat did that we praise God's glory and take comfort in his promises. When you look at verse nine, it says, and this is what Jehoshaphat, he's still in prayer with God. If an evil comes upon us as the sword, judgment or pestilence or famine, we stand before this house and in your presence for your name is in this house and cry unto you in our affliction, then you will hear and help. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> One of the things that we see, not only in verse nine, but throughout all of the scriptures is that we find God's people and God's word affirming that he will never leave or forsake his people. And, and going back to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, is Solomon dedicated the temple, which I think it's fitting that is Jehoshaphat is praying on behalf of his nation, praying, on, praying to their God. He's standing in the same temple where these words were shared by Solomon when it was dedicated at the first. And in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, the word of God says this, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and listen and turn from their wicked ways. You know, Solomon understood that the blessing of God was contingent upon the obedience of God's people to look to him for the provision and, and to look to him in humble obedience. And what we find is Jehoshaphat knowing that there is a situation out of his control, willingly humbling himself before the God of his salvation, committing himself and his people to seeking the face of the one who promised to respond when they humbly did so. In 7.14 in Second Chronicles, it goes on to say, Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. 
And so wisely, Jehoshaphat looks to the one who had promised to never leave nor forsake those who would call out upon his name. And then once he, once he went to the Lord in prayer, we see the fifth thing that Solomon did, or that Jehoshaphat did, was completely commit the situation to the Lord. We are so good at going to the Lord, but we're also good at going back and taking it out of his hands and trying to do things in our own power and our own strength. After having just said, you're our God, we're your people, this is your land, we need your help. We see that Jehoshaphat leaves this into the hand of the one who's capable of dealing with it. In verses 10 through 12, we read this, and now... Behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldst not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. He's like, listen, these people that when you freed the Israelites from Egypt's bondage, that these people that you told us not to destroy, to to not lay the hammer down, but instead we spared them. He says, these are the people who are giving us grief now. He said, behold, in verse 11, I say how they reward us to come to come to cast us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. He said, the very people that we spared are not sparing us in return. And there is absolutely nothing we can do about it. Verse 12, our God, will you not judge them? He said, God, we we can't do this. This is an enemy that's insurmountable and we don't have the resources to handle it. He said, for we have no might against this great company that comes against us, neither we know we what to do. He said, we're not strong enough, we're not wise enough, but our eyes are on you. We're powerless, we're clueless, but our eyes are on you. talking with another ministry leader this past week, we talked about that very topic. The days like today when kids can't fill camps and congregants aren't filling pews, it can be a scary time, not just for businesses, but for ministries as well. And then that leader went on to say, and yet it's so exciting, because maybe for the first time in a long time, we're actually completely dependent upon God. And as God's people, I can't think of a better position to be in. And as was shared earlier, when Jehoshaphat went to God in prayer and fasting, demonstrating his absolute need for wisdom, guidance, direction, and provision, an entire nation followed his example. And and what you do in this life and in this trial, whatever that adversity is right now, it doesn't just matter for you and the others involved that are a part of that situation. It's everyone around you looking to you, watching you as you navigate this storm. And what Jehoshaphat did in this moment was not wasted. And we're gonna see the story ends well. But we also see that the lesson that that God's people learned was a lesson that inspired hope and courage for for people 150 years down the line. And, And if you were to go to 2 Chronicles 32, and in just a little bit, I'll share a couple verses with you. 150 years removed from Jehoshaphat saying, we are powerless, we're clueless, but our eyes are on you. The nation of Judah was facing an Assyrian invasion as King Sennacherib had surrounded Judah. And and again, death and defeat seemed imminent. But God's man, Isaiah, came to God's king, Hezekiah, and he assured him that he needed to look to God for his provision and for his deliverance. And King Hezekiah sought the Lord And listen to what he said to the people confidently as they turned their hearts to God. In 2 Chronicles 32, verses 7 through 8, in the midst of fear and unknown. And I know this is scary for us today. And sometimes it's easy to get tunnel vision and all we can see is what we're going through right now. And I find it so helpful to go back and look at battles that might have been bigger and even scarier. And if you knew anything about the Assyrians, they were merciless people. And God's people, all of them were in jeopardy of being slaughtered. And yet listen to the confidence of the king who had turned to the rock of his salvation. He says, be strong and courageous. 
Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And what I love about this battle, it wasn't the arm of flesh that delivered Israel either. One angel of the Lord smote 185,000 of Sennacherib's mightiest warriors. And God's people were delivered as they looked to him for their salvation. But as we look at point number six, in order for that salvation to come, God's people had to willingly obey God's instructions. God's people had to willingly obey God's instructions. As we look at verses 15 through 21, and actually I want to back up to verse 13 and 14 and read those as well. Has a, Jehoshaphat has cried out his, his plea to the Lord. And in the midst of doing so, verse 13, and all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeiel, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the spear of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, hearken ye, listen up, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid nor dismayed by the reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go you down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You shall not need to fight in this battle. He said, set yourselves and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel, with a loud voice on high. Verse 20, And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, and so shall you prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord and that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. I don't know if you were paying close attention, but God's king just said, we're powerless, we're clueless against this army that's coming against us and our eyes are on you. And God through his prophet said, uh, Jehoshaphat, I want you to send the marching band into battle. Now, if that doesn't catch you as a little funny, it certainly does me. But one thing I also notice is that Jehoshaphat doesn't question God's word. Because the last time he did, he almost lost his life. In 2 Chronicles chapter 18, Jehoshaphat and Ahab, they formed this alliance and they're gonna go into battle. But before they go into battle, Jehoshaphat said, isn't there a man of God in the midst of all of you that could give us some clear direction whether we should go or not? And Ahab said, yeah, there's this one guy, Micaiah, but I hate him. He never says anything good about me. Every, every time I ask him, he always says something evil. And he says, well, I want to hear what this man has to say. And so after all of the king's men, Ahab's men, have told him, oh, go ahead and go. You're going to win the battle. You're going to come back victorious with the spoils of war. The man of God is brought before Jehoshaphat and Ahab. And initially, sarcastically, he says, oh, yeah, you got this. Go ahead and go. And Ahab's like, well, how many times do I have to ask you? Be straight with me. Tell me the truth. He says, listen, you're dying. You're not coming out of this alive. And Ahab says, see, I told you, he never says what I want to hear. And so they slap him, they throw him in jail, and they go with the evil counsel of the false prophets. Ahab paid dearly with his life, and Jehoshaphat learned the hard way. But this time, we find the king willingly obeying God's instructions. The question I have for us today a question, 
Have we learned our lessons from being disobedient or untrusting in the past? You know, I want to be sensitive in saying this, but as we were in prayer prior to this service, I realize this is kind of sensitive. I am not a disease specialist. I'm not a physician. I'm not a political leader of this nation to make the decisions that our leaders have made. But I am a child of God. And as such, I've been simply asked to follow some guidelines, uh, putting my own thoughts and my, my own opinions uh, in the back, on the back burner and instead looking for the well-being of everyone else around me. And because Romans 13 verses 1 and 2 tell me that God has raised up and he takes down leaders and he has given them to us for our good. And so as long as they're not calling us to disobey God and his word, out of loving obedience to God, we should honor them. And it hit me really hard in prayer before this service and challenged my own heart as well that if I'm that unwilling to follow the basic instructions of man who is looking out for the well-being of others, then what am I going to do as God's person when he tells me to send the marching band into battle? And it was a serious gut check for even myself as we were in prayer to question, will I respond when God asks me to do the ridiculous? And as Pastor Blair shared one time, when God's people, in accordance to his word and his will, are willing to do the ridiculous, God is willing to do the miraculous. And what we find is that when God's people willingly obeyed God's, God's instructions, they had the privilege of praising God, number seven, for his deliverance. In verses 22 and following, listen to what God's word says to God's people. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah. And they were smitten, for the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. In verse 24, and when Judah came toward the, the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, they were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none had escaped. God's people simply provided them music for the work that God was going to do. Not one of the enemy soldiers were standing because they had turned upon themselves. God had miraculously delivered his people because they were willing to do the ridiculous in response and obedience to his word. In verse 25, when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering of the spoil. It was so much. It's incredible to think that a king went to prayer and fasting thinking they were going to get destroyed. But because they were willing to, to humble themselves before the Lord God and obey him. They found themselves more richly blessed than they could have ever imagined. And on the fourth day, they assembled themselves in the Valley of Berica, for they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of the same place was called the Valley of Berica unto this day. Then they returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem, and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them to go again to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them to rejoice over their enemies." And they came to Jerusalem with psalteries and harps and trumpets unto the house of the Lord. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they had heard that the Lord fought against the enemies of Israel. So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet for his God gave him rest round about. And as they praised the Lord for his deliverance, what did the king have to do to experience the victory? Trust and obey the word of God. And Heston Chapel, through the course of this trial and every adversity that comes our way, may we be quick to do the same. And so when a situation comes your way that's out of your control, a situation that's beyond your ability to handle, what are the steps we should take? Number one, immediately, immediately seek 
the Lord. And please know that when you do, the eyes of everyone around you will be on you. They're going to watch your response, but they also get to see God's deliverance. But after you seek the Lord, in the midst of that, as you go to him in prayer, acknowledge his sovereignty and his power, even through this trial that you're facing. Remember, don't run away and don't run from him. Run to him during this time. And seek, thirdly, his assistance, knowing how much he cares for you. I mean, every time you look at the cross of Calvary, remember the depths to which Christ was willing to go to not only set you free from sin, but to demonstrate the depth and the riches of his love for you. And if God is willing to do that through his son when you were an enemy, how much more can you trust him as his son or his daughter? And as you go to him in prayer, understanding that he's sovereign and he's in control of this situation, knowing how much he cares for you, Praise him for his glory and take comfort in the promises of his word, which not one will fail. And then fifthly, com completely submit and commit the situation to him. Remember the words of Jehoshaphat, I'm powerless, I'm clueless, but my eyes are on you. And in God's strength, keep them there. And then number six, once you committed to him and you've sought him in prayer, you've gone to his word, you've sought godly counsel, no matter how tempting it is to go the wrong way, no matter how tempting it is to do what's easier, what you think is for your good, be willing to obey God's instructions. And as you obey his instructions, like Jehoshaphat, it had to be at the forefront of his mind, don't forget about the failures and, our, and the consequences that we face from the past when we negated to obey his word. Willingly obey his instructions. And then in advance, you can even follow number seven, praise him for his helping hand of deliverance. Heston Chapel, to God be the glory, not only through this current trial, but everyone we face for his honor, his glory, and his praise. Let us pray. Father, we, we come to you today. And Lord, we, we are in the midst of a situation that genuinely is beyond the the total comprehension of any one of us as citizens, not only of this country, but on, on this globe. Um, Lord, it's something that I personally can't stop, I can't contain, but I can trust the one who can. In many ways, as our government is trying and governments around this world are trying to find ways to slow the spread and to settle things down, our hope isn't found in man and its methods or even our government. As much as we need to heed their, 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 their guidelines, our hope is in you. And Lord, is, is our sovereign God, we genuinely believe that you have allowed this. Not a question. If you're sovereign, you're in control. This didn't catch you off guard. This didn't catch you sleeping. You weren't asleep at the switch. And, and uh, Lord, you know. And you know the ways in which this will be used even for good. Father, for those who are, are suffering and struggling right now, and we do think of those nations that are b behind the ball here, so to speak, and, and Lord, their medical professionals are crying out for help and assistance. Lord, we pray that they would look to you. And Lord, we do ask that your hands and feet around this world would rise up to assist them. And that, Lord, through all of this, that they might see your hand at work in the midst of this storm. And, Father, for us as your people, as, as tempting as it is to complain, as tempting as it is to be harsh and critical toward one another, toward our governor, toward our president, toward the Senate, toward the Congress, toward the Supreme Court, whoever it is that we can, we can throw our ire at, Lord, I pray that, that rather than be negative and critical and judgmental and condescending as your people, let us be prayerful. Let us be praising in the midst of the unknown as Paul and Silas stretched and all but ripped apart by those chains as they were bleeding and, and an infection was setting in. Lord, let us be praising you. Let us be seeking you in prayer because there's a world watching. And I pray that in the midst of this trial, that of all that they could see from us, they could see Christ and the hope that the cross affords. Lord, in the areas where we stumbled, I ask that you'd forgive us. In the areas where maybe we've not done the right things, Lord, help us to rectify that. 
And Lord, there are trials being experienced right now that have nothing to do with a worldwide pandemic. And we lift those, Lord, up before the throne of grace. We ask that as your people, we'd be so quick to look to you, to acknowledge your sovereignty and your control, to hold on to your promises and your faithfulness, to commit it to you, to obey you, knowing that by doing so, we will be able to praise you as we see your hand of deliverance at work. Be glorified through this in all things we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to sing together, O Church, Arise. Father, as we close this service in in prayer this morning, and just as we sang those words from that Keith and Kristen Getty song, O Church Arise, uh, Lord, I am so grateful that by closing the doors of a building, we have not shut down the ministry of the body of Christ. And Lord, as we shared in that one call earlier this week, as, as Paul was bound to a Roman centurion, uh, as he was bound 24 hours a day, I love what God's man said. He said, I might be bound, but the word of God is not bound. And Lord, I thank you that as your vessels, as your mouthpieces and your servants, the word of God can flow richly and freely through our hearts and our lives and even our keyboards in the week ahead. 
And Lord God, I pray that the church would rise up. Lord, this is a time that, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. And maybe the army of God should get the sword of the spirit in their hands. And Lord, it might be time for God's people to get serious about studying your word. And through your Holy Spirit's power, see it applied in their hearts and their lives. And Lord, as that word is applied in our hearts and our lives, the overflow of that will pour into a broken and hurting, sin-stained and scared world around us. As the church rises up and as the world that is broken and in such need of hope sees the courage and the confidence of God's people, Lord, I thank you in advance for the honor, the glory, and the praise that you'll receive as men and women trust you on the salvation. Lord God, use us mightily as your people. Lord, rather than stew and commiserate, Lord, I pray that we'd be quick to be on our knees in prayer. And if we're going to be on those, those telephones and on those computers, I pray we'd be using them for good, Lord, to to reach out to those, not just in the congregation, but Lord, in our neighborhood that we know could use a touch, that we know could use a voice, that we know could use some encouragement, that we know could use some hope. And may you speak richly and freely through us as those vessels. We pray in Christ's mighty name. Amen.